Hey guys, so uh, last time I went through and I showed you how to find a reducible representation for a molecule with symmetry and then reduce that down to a set of irreducible representations and then find the vibrational modes of stretching from that. So this time I want to kind of go through with a molecule but only talk about the bonds because you can go through and use group theory and find only how these bonds have vibrational modes. So let's start with H2O. This one's pretty easy. As you probably know by now, H2O is C2V. And C2V is nice because it has a very small character table. So let's go through and do this really quick. The first symmetry operation is E. The second is C2. The third is a reflection plane. And this is usually designated XC. And the final one is another reflection plane. And this is usually designated YZ. Okay. So the way this is different from solving for an entire molecule is you go through and look at each different bond you want to look at. And also, you don't have to do the contribution per atom. All you have to do is move these bonds through symmetry operations and see if they're unshifted. This is much easier, actually. So let's just look at the OH bond. And there's two of them. There's one here, one here. So for E, that's a two. And for the C2, remember for this we're just going to go down the middle here. So they would both rotate. So you're going to get a zero there. Goose egg. And um, the next one's a CV. And usually, I think I mentioned this one time before, although you can look and see which axis we're talking about here, the easiest way to do this is just pretty much by convention, you go through the, the uh, reflection plane with the most atoms in it first. So in this case, we're going to have two here because it's going to be the reflection plane in the plane of the paper, like that. So that's going to be a two. And finally, the other reflection plane is going to be the one perpendicular to that. So again, that's going to be a zero. Now, you might think we're done, but actually there's another bond in here. We have an H-O-H bond. And these are a little different the way you want to treat a bond through three atoms like this. So look, we're, we're looking at each of these separately. Just remember that. So there's only one of these in the molecule, that is the whole molecule. And if you do a C2, even though it looks like it switches all the way around, we treat the bond as one entity. So actually, it's not going to move. And again, that one's going to be in the plane. And this is kind of tricky here. This one, even though you're coming through this reflection plane that seems like it's perpendicular to the way the entire molecule is oriented, again, that bond is treated as one entity. So even though it reflects over itself, it's the same bond. So it still counts as one here. We say there's no change. So let's start with the first one, um, just the OH bonds, and we'll take the we'll reduce that reducible representation down to a set of irreducible representations. So we pull out our C2V character table here. For A1, it's all ones. And first let's find H. H is four. It's just one for each. So let me write that up here. H is four. Okay, so it's pretty easy to see. You have 2 plus 0 plus 2 plus 0. 
2, 0, 2, 0. So for this one right here, and actually this is so simple, I'm not going to write all of this out. Just this first one. It's 2 plus 0, because remember the whole a1, that's all just times 1 for each of them. Our h is 4, so we're going to get 4 over 4, and we're going to get 1 for the a1 term. Okay, then let's look at a2. We have 1, 1, negative 1, and negative 1. So you might be able to see right away, you're going to have a positive 2, a 0, a negative 2, and a 0. So you're not going to have an a2 term. a2 is going to cancel out. For B1, let's just make a note of that. A2 equals 0. Okay. And for B1, you have negative 1, negative 1. All right. So for B1, you're going to have 2 and 2. So B1, you're going to have 1 for. Because those negative 1s are multiplied by 0, you can see in here, by those zeros. And for B2, 1, negative 1, negative 1, 1. So we're going to have 1 times 0 times negative 2 times 1. So B2 is going to also equal 0. So for that top one, we're going to have 1A and B1. Let me open up another page here real quick. Just so we remember what we're talking about here. I just had 1, 1, 1, 1. I'm not even going to write out the symmetry operations because there's only four of them and we've got ones for everything. So it's pretty straightforward. For A1, it's just going to work. It's going to be 1. So 1 times 1 is 1. Same thing. And the same thing twice more times 1 over 4 and you have 4 over 4 equals 1a1 okay alright and then for a2 you have two positive ones and two negative ones so a2 you're gonna get 0 I'll draw this one out just so you guys can see this. Math isn't too hard here though, so uh, this is the only one I'm going to draw out. That's going to cancel out the zero inside those parentheses in there. So nothing there. And B1, again you have two positive ones, two negative ones, that's going to cancel out B2 two positive ones, two negative ones, that's going to cancel out again. So basically, right, let me just start a new page again. <laughs> For the HO bond, oh, we have A1, plus B1 and for that HOH bond all we have is an A1 
So you have two vibrational modes of stretching here, and you have one vibrational mode, right? well, not necessarily stretching, but one vibrational mode for this bond. And you can see for A1 you have a Z, so that's going to be infrared. And for B1 you have an X, so that's also going to be infrared. Remember if they have translational terms, Z, X, or Y, you're going to get infrared in there. And let's keep talking about infrared a little bit. Again, you're going to have infrared for here. So remember, um, what shows up on infrared is when you have stretching and bending. So if we have some stretching, let's say this bond moves in this way and that bond moves in that way, you're going to have some kind of stretching. And this stretching, the, the idea of group theory is you can find the amount of symmetry in the molecule and you can see there's more stretching and more symmetrical molecules. We did that one earlier, the, um, the D3H trigonal bipyramidal. You, s you can see there were a lot, of, I think there were like five stretching modes, or vibrational modes. So you had a lot of possible, um, a lot of possible bands that were going to show up on IR. And now if you have something organic, and a lot of, um, that's not very good. <laughs> A lot of organic stuff is chiral, as you know. So if you had something like this, that is why on organic you have a little chart and you can just go and look and see if you have one of these bonds that's going to show up here. It's less complicated. You're pretty much going to get one band for each bond. In inorganic species, however, with metals and you have a lot of the same ligands around the same center, you're going to get multiple bands for the same for um, the same kind of bond. That's why we actually need group theory to predict these kind of bonds. And it gets even more complicated, actually, because there's combinations that occur. But that's beyond the scope of this, so I hope this was helpful. This is just bonds, and the uh, bonds are a lot easier to calculate than um, whole molecules. So next time we'll do a bigger one, or we'll do something more complicated. So, alright guys, see you next time.